Bernard Sexton, you have been researching in a number of countries on the issue of natural resources and conflict, and you are currently finalizing your PhD at the New York University. And you have been speaking to a large audience here in Berlin at the Heinrich Böll Foundation's event on natural resources, conflict and development. Could you please give us a short description about the issues of natural resources and conflict in Afghanistan? Natural resources are perhaps the most important issue facing Afghanistan today, in the sense that they form the basis uh, for almost all Afghans of their local livelihoods. What does that mean? That means that in their daily life, Afghans rely on their local natural resources uh, for survival. So when we talk about natural resources, we're talking about things like land, like water, like uh, forests where you extract timber for firewood and uh, for other things. We're talking about local level mineral extraction and things like that. So natural resources are both an economic, a political, a social issue, um, and something that, that should be taken very seriously. When we look at the withdrawal of international troops from Afghanistan and the country's economic development and um, the fact that there are supposed to be trillions of US dollars and of resources available in the country, what does this mean for the politics of transition? That's a very good question. I think the most important starting point uh, for this question is a matter of expectations. And what's been reported in the press and what's been touted by international actors as being a, a mineral bonanza, if you will, worth perhaps a trillion dollars, uh, it is raising the expectations of both the Afghan people, the Afghan government, as well as the international community in a somewhat unreasonable way. Uh, when we look at the large-scale mineral wealth of Afghanistan, most of it is pretty inaccessible and uh, will take perhaps decades to come online, if ever. It may be the case that some of these resources never become economically viable at an international level. Because things like copper and iron, uh, things of that nature, can be purchased almost anywhere on the planet these days. And so um, when we are thinking about transition in Afghanistan, um, we have to think about who is going to benefit from the kinds of investments that are being made. And uh, one point that I've consistently made and talked about earlier today is that elite actors, people in the government, people who are uh, involved in business, stand to benefit a great deal from the exploitation of large-scale mines and minerals, including uh, the oil and gas sector. Whereas it's unclear that at the local level, the majority of Afghans are uh, in a position to, to benefit from this. And we can look no farther than other places in the region, elsewhere in the world, um, in general at what's happened over the last 50 years as countries have uh, begun to produce uh, extractive industries, whether it's oil, whether it's minerals, and so forth, about where it is that those benefits end up going. And it's closely related to politics. In fact, it's almost entirely dependent on politics. So when we see countries that have small elites, uh, business elites, political elites, uh, it's much easier for those leaders to take the revenues from the extractive sector and use it for patronage politics to pay off whoever it is that keeps them in power, their winning coalition, if you will. When that winning coalition is small, uh, it's much easier to just pay them off with private goods. So you hand out some money to your cronies uh, rather than using those uh, resources to invest in public goods for the country. When we look at countries where these revenues have produced uh, meaningful, tangible benefits for the whole population, it's in countries where there's a, a large winning coalition, where uh, leaders rely on a large number of people to stay in power. And uh, in places like uh, the Southern Cone in Latin America, when we look at places like Botswana, or perhaps uh, in Europe like uh, Norway, these are countries where the leadership relies on a large number of people in the country to stay in power. And so, it's much easier for them to invest in public goods, for example, roads, education, healthcare, things like that, than to pay off all the members that they need to, to support them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when we look at Afghanistan, we see that because of the uh, corruption in the elections, because of the way that power um, is sort of uh, allocated and, and demanded down the barrel of the gun, so to speak, um, it's a relatively small number of people that are going to be involved in uh, getting the benefits from most of these mineral resources. And so what we should expect, sadly, is that most of them are going to be either stolen, uh, expropriated, 
um, and in the end, not invested in public benefits for the Afghan people. And that should give us really a lot of pause about whether the claims that have, have, have been made by the international community about uh, the resources that are going to be uh, gotten from the extractive sector. Could you please speak a little bit more about how this plays out on resources like land and water? Land and water are uh, fundamental in Afghanistan in the sense that basically every Afghan relies on land or water in one way or another to survive. Most Afghans are subsistence, either farmers or, or livestock owners. Um, sometimes they are sedentary, they live in one place throughout the year. Sometimes they're nomads. Um, there are several million um, extensive producers, as they're called, people that move from one place to the other, depending on the season. And uh, as a result, land ownership, particularly in a country like Afghanistan, where uh, it's semi-arid, there's not a whole lot of land to go around. Uh, land ownership, uh, land stability um, is fundamental to, to people's survival. And as a result, it quickly becomes a, a political issue. For example, when we look at an ongoing conflict between the Kuchi nomadic uh, herders, who are Pashtuns, and, for example, the Hazara people, um, who are Shiites that live in the Central Highlands, Every season uh, since 2002, there have been uh, summertime clashes between the two groups. And that is over rangeland, over summer uh, rangelands that um, are important for both groups in order to have livestock to, to make it through the winter and to sell at market. When we talk about water, there's various different um, elements that we need to think about. One is drinking water in fast growing Afghan cities. There's a, a critical uh, lack of, of drinking water for many people. I think the figure hovers around 50% of people that actually have access to clean drinking water. That's a growing problem. Um, we can also talk about irrigation, where the water infrastructure in the country is uh, typically very poor. In contrast, the, the governance systems that exist are actually typically pretty good, especially in the north, where you have traditional water management systems, often called uh, a mirob system, which means a water master or water uh, leader who manages to, to balance between upstream and downstream um, communities uh, fairly well. And uh, even with poor infrastructure, uh, you often find that the, the management is, is really quite good. And given scarce resources, Afghans do really quite well at, at, at maintaining a reasonable agricultural output, given the circumstances. What is the most pressing natural resource challenge Afghanistan faces at the moment? That's certainly a challenging question in the sense that there are so many challenges that Afghanistan faces today in this, in this sector. Um, I would argue that the water uh, situation would be the highest priority in the sense that there's the biggest bang for the buck that you can get by investing in the, in the water sector. Um, the mineral sector is um, highly variable. We're not really sure what may or may not come out of it. Uh, most of it's going to be captured by elite actors, warlords, political manipulation. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, it seems that, that there won't be a whole lot of public benefits that come out of it. Similarly, on, on the land issue, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging. Um, and, and before you can really make improvements, it's going to take uh, a lot of sorting out of these titling issues and, and, and so forth. The water sector is a place where the governance is relatively good, as I mentioned, um, and investing in water um, in both produce energy, um, it, it is a place where Afghanistan uh, needs to make some um, arrangements with its neighbors, for example. Most of the uh, river basins don't have water sharing agreements with the neighbors. And water infrastructure, in addition, um, is, is typically a highly public good in the sense that it's hard to steal a canal. It's hard to, to expropriate uh, um, uh, a dam, for example. I mean, there are certainly means for, for corruption, right? For example, in the construction of a dam, you can hand out the construction contracts to, to your cronies, and you can um, ensure that the canals with, for your political allies are the ones that get the attention first. But it's something where even if you do um, patronage politics, there still are these spillover effects that have positive benefits for the whole population. And so for me, uh, that's, the, that's really the place where over the next 10 years, solid investment could produce both uh, livelihood and political benefits for, for the country. You were just mentioning the influence of regional powers and transboundary water issues. Could you please speak a little bit more about that? Um, so Afghanistan is blessed with uh, incredible mountains where each winter uh, a great deal of snowpack uh, 
uh, comes during, uh, in the form of precipitation that's frozen. Um, in fact, about half of Afghanistan is completely frozen and almost in inaccessible during the winter months. During the rest of the year, that snow melts and uh, almost overnight becomes uh, quite impressive rivers that flow for several months. Um, that water is fundamental to uh, agriculture, it's fundamental to, to livestock because um, it allows the grasses to grow. Unfortunately, after the snowpack is completely melted, the rivers almost entirely dry up by the end of summertime. And because there's limited uh, structures for uh, holding the water uh, during the drier periods, a lot of the water is, is lost and just continues downstream into the neighboring countries. <clears throat> Over time, the neighboring countries like Iran and Pakistan in particular, um, as well as the Central Asian neighbors to the north, have become quite accustomed to the water not staying in Afghanistan and instead flowing downstream. And so their agricultural operations are reliant on these Afghan waters um, that traditionally have flowed into their countries and not been used in Afghanistan. So schemes to uh, retain some of that water, whether it's for hydroelectric power or for agriculture or for industrial use, for drinking has been met with uh, uh, no small amount of resistance from, for example, Pakistan and Iran. So while you could argue that Afghanistan uh, holds a strong claim to that water, um, the downstream uh, neighbors who are substantially stronger in many ways uh, are not going to be very happy with the, with the idea of Afghans using more of it. And so there has to be some kind of an arrangement uh, that's made over time, or else we're going to see more situations like the uh, Salma Dam project, where um, Iran uh, actually interfered with the construction of the Salma Dam, uh, which was being done by India, um, in an effort to prevent that dam from coming online, and, as they feared, slowing down, or indeed perhaps for up to a year, stopping the flow of the Hari Road River. And so that's the sort of thing that, that uh, Afghanistan is worried about, and um, is clearly a political as opposed to a, a resource, um, a technical resource issue. Do you see any possibility of uh, civil society actors, primarily in Afghanistan, but uh, maybe also on both sides of the border, of getting involved? Certainly. Uh, civil society is, is fundamental to this, in the sense that, mm, especially when political elites see their uh, interest in a, you know, one particular area, for example, generating revenues, um, Civil society often have the voice of communities that need water on a, uh, on a regular basis. And so that voice uh, is a measure of accountability that can put pressure on the political elites to do right by them rather than sort of looking out for themselves. Um, and so civil society can help to um, erode, if not eliminate, the sort of patronage politics that I was talking about earlier and help to uh, make the, the winning coalition, as, as, as you say. Um, a little bit bigger. Thank you very much for this broad overview and detailed insight on natural resource issues in Afghanistan.